Ron, good to see you. I think that we will officially start. So this meeting is called to order. And just please note that um, you can choose to either um, be in uh, speaker mode or gallery mode, up to you. And um, that you are um, muted and you'll need to unmute if you want to speak. And I would like to start out, um, well, I think we'll, we'll go ahead and, yeah, no, I'll, I'll start out with a quote and then we'll go to uh, confirmation of the quorum. So um, I would like to start out with a quote today in honor of International Women's Month. And I chose a quote from um, one of my early um, uh, folks who I just looked up to and uh, saw as a real role model. And that is uh, Bella Abzug, um, who, for those of you who are younger than me, which is many, many of you, um, she was known as a fierce fighter for feminism, for the underdog, for um, minority rights. And uh, she was um, known as uh, battling Bella. And she was in the, she was in Congress. Um, she, she had a surprise win uh, in 1971 in New York and um, was in Congress for a number of years after that. She fought hard for the National Women's Political Caucus for the ERA. She was a lawyer specializing in labor rights, tenant rights, civil rights. She uh, was very proud, I think, to be on Nixon's enemies list. She was one of the first members of Congress to support gay rights. Um, here's a great quote from her that I think is still um, extremely timely. Bella Abzug. Women's struggle for equality worldwide is about more than equality between men and women. Our struggle is about reversing the trends of social, economic, political, and ecological crisis, a global nervous breakdown. Our struggle is about creating sustainable lives and attainable dreams. Thank you. And we will now move to roll call with Tafin. Hi, everyone. I apologize in advance if I don't say your name correctly. Please do correct me. Addison County, Zoe Caslow? Present and voting. Abigail Bloom? Present and voting. Dave Silberman? Silberman, present and Silberman. voting. Silberman, thank you. Alternate Andrew Pizzullo? Jeannie Albert? Stephen Butterfield, Bennington County, James Ramsey. Present and voting. Asha Edelson. Present and voting. Susan Borden. Present and voting. Alternates, Alexandra Hines. Lynn Mazza. Jeff Cleary. Present, not voting. Caledonia County, Mimi Smythe. Present and voting. Susan Puckler. I see Susan's there. Um, Stephen uh, Amos. Sorry. Stephen present Amos. And voting. Present and voting. Uh, Joanna Holzenberg. Keith Ballack. Dennis LeBounty. Chittenden County, Ed Cafferty. Present in voting. Carol Smith. Present in voting. Andrew Champagne. Hi, Tashane. Present in voting. Alternates, Michael Ross. Julia Bonds. Skylar Nash. Essex County, Laura Wilson. Present and voting. Ed Clark. Present and voting. Franklin County, David Glidden. Present and voting. Lauren Dees Erickson. Present, Present and, voting. and voting. Raya Erickson. Present and voting. Alternates Mike McCarthy. Noah Detzer. <laughs> Ewan Bear. Grand Isle County, Mitzi Johnson. 
Carol Tremble, Rich Gogan, alternates Doug DiCibito, Lamoille County, Scott Weathers. President Dan, Oh, thanks, Scott. Dan Noyes, Marina Mirberg, alternates Elena Hunt, Lee Rauch, Rauch, Leo Clark, Orange County, Sherry Merrick. Present and voting. Kelsey Root Winchester. Present and voting. Perry Kachik, Kasich. Perry. <laughs> Present and voting. Thank you. Jill, alternates Jill Michaels. Paul Perkins. Justin Will, Orleans County, Brian Carroll. President and voting. Benjamin Applegate, Samantha Stevens Kinsley. Present and voting and just Samantha Stevens. Okay, Samantha Stevens, thank you. Um, alternates Walter Medwitt, Mary Beth Medwitt. Jane Malgary, Rutland County, Noah French, Heather Julianson Stevenson. Present and voting. Uh, Joshua Ferguson. Alternates Barbara Noise Pulling. Present. Carol Wright. Sorry, am I allowed to say Barbara vote? Present, Barbara, and, you... present and voting. Thank you, Heather. Thank you. Carol Wright. Annie Stratton. Washington County, Dorothy Kyle. Elise Thornson. Present and voting. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I didn't unmute. <laughs> Thank you, Dottie. Uh, Elise Thornson. Uh, present and voting. Matt Levin. Presidents in voting. Good morning, everyone. Um, alternates, Amanda Gus Gustin. Present and not voting. Jeb Bouchard. Connor Casey. Uh, present and not voting. Wyndham County, Angela Lawrence. Angela Lawrence. Present and voting. Thank you. Will Crother. Present voting. Alton, uh, Tim Harris. Alternates Laura Shab Shabon. Shabon. I'm sorry if I'm not saying that correctly. Kelly Frost. Ian Heffler. Ian Heffley, uh, present. Heffley, <laughs> state. Oh, my apologies. Ian Windsor is voting. County. Ian is oh. voting. Windsor County, Susan Waterman. Present and voting. Shaw Ostland. Present and voting. Ted Cody. Alternates Dottie Beans. Ted is here, but I don't know why he didn't respond. Oh. Um, Alternates Dottie Beans. Melinda Major. Allison Clarkson. DNC, Tim German. Hi, Jeffine. Present and voting. Mary Sullivan. President voting. Um, offices and Lisa. I'm here. Present, present. Yes. And I call David Glidden. Um, Deb, Deb Barrier. Here. And then I called Noah Detzler. Executive committee members who are not on, not otherwise state committee members. Liz Brown. Samantha Sheehan. Ryan McLaren. I am here. Terry Anderson. Owen Doherty. Present. Brenda Churchill. Present. Bill Bruce Olson. Jeanette White. And Martha Allen. Present. And we have quorum. Great.
Thank you very much. We're going to move on to review and approval of the minutes. Um, is there a motion to approve and please say your name in a second. So moved, Susan Borden. Eve Amos, I'll, I'll vote on motion to approve. Okay, and a, and a second? Second. And that's who? Mary Sullivan. Very good, thank you. All right, it's now open for discussion. And I wanna note that just looking over these minutes, I just see that we have to capitalize the L, the L in Ryan McLaren's last name. So that's one correction I'll make. Others? Anyone else? Okay, um, I wanna say this is a tribute to our secretary, Tafine. These notes are hard to take. There's a lot to this. And uh, Tafine's uh, really putting her nose to the grindstone and making it very easy for me. So I, I wanna thank you, Tafine. Um, I think that now uh, hearing no other corrections, we will now vote on the minutes as uh, amended by one letter. And uh, we'll take a, a voice vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Aye. Aye. The minutes stand approved. So we are going to move on to the <clears throat> chair's report. Oh my gosh, it's been a busy month. <laughs> I think every month is going to be a busy month in this job. Fortunately, I um, really, really like it. And I feel like I have so many of you I can turn to for help, we have a great team and um, I can't imagine what it would be like if that wasn't the case because there's a lot going on and, and I need all the help that, that you folks um, so generously give me. Um, I, I want to just touch for one brief second, but I'm gonna leave it to our um, committee man and woman to report on our DNC meeting. But I just wanna say that personally, it was really inspiring for me to be at my first DNC meeting in Washington, DC. Um, I was just struck by the diversity, by the range of experience, by the stories folks shared, both personal and professional, and by how um, incredibly uh, supportive folks were and willing to just, you know, help out a, a new chair. And at, at, at anywhere I turned, I, I met folks who were just willing and positive and um, really gave us some excellent resources. And that was um, also um, both officially and formally from the DNC and, and the sessions they arranged as, as well as folks I met there. So it was a very, very positive, even though it took me, oh, such, I had such a saga uh, getting back, including two extra nights overnight in DC, which uh, you don't even want to hear about, but I'm back. <laughs> All right. Um, as we know, campaigns are getting underway. We are going to have the most active primary season. It's like every time you turn around or uh, read Seven Days or VT Digger, we have a new candidate, including a couple just this week. Um, and uh, with that, I'd like to turn it over to my partner, David Glidden, to uh, just touch on campaigns and the coordinated campaign. David? Yeah, thank you, Anne. <clears throat> um, so we at the VDP have been having our initial conversations with our various wonderful Democratic candidates about what this year's coordinated campaign is going to look like. And Claire and I have been compiling that information so that both the party can respond to their needs, but also um, so that we can understand what they're planning and what we can provide as the VDP. Later on, we'll talk about some really exciting uh, money we've gotten from the DNC for our coordinated campaign, but that has been um, really useful in seeding this year's campaign. And the other thing I'll add, as Anne said, there are many new candidates announcing, and this is a great opportunity uh, both for county parties uh, and even some town parties to invite candidates either to forums or to their uh, uh, committee meetings to engage new people. If we get our candidates in front of as many voters as possible right now during the primary, it'll help us in the general because people will be familiar with our wonderful nominees. Um, the other thing I will add to what Anne said, and this is a personal note of privilege, um, loved the DNC meeting, uh, but was surprised to discover in the Eastern region, which is 
uh, Pennsylvania, no, Maryland North. So all of those states, Pennsylvania, New York, New England, I'm one of two members under 37. So just <laughs> saying, encourage young people to step up uh, in our party structure here in Vermont so that we aren't lacking behind like the rest of the country is. But that is my updates on campaigns. And I'll turn it back to Anne, unless I missed something. Great, thanks. Um so campaigns, how do we uh, fuel our campaigns? Well, with people and with money. And so I'm gonna talk, talk about money right now. Um, we absolutely need to focus on strengthening our party through fundraising. That um, was one of the goals that kind of was uh, brought, you know, put on my lap when I first came. We gotta do more fundraising. I don't love it, but um, I know how important it is. And so I'm, I'm getting there, I'm embracing it. And I wanna talk about just a, a few ways that we're going about this and, and that we need you, of course. Um, Power Vermont Blue, uh, our, our, uh, our uh, Kate, Kate, who we uh, miss, of course, fundraising, uh, fundraising finance uh, director. Uh, she did a great job in uh, setting up our little contest, which uh, ran through March 1st. We gained over 100 new members. And what we were really focusing on was um, folks uh, becoming monthly members, which is very easy to do, but we also counted annual new memberships. We got over 100 new members. Um, and the winners of this contest were Orange County, which now gets 40% rebate on their donations for the next year, Orleans, which gets 35% for the next year, and Caledonia, which gets 30% for the next year. Remember, you all get 25% rebate, which I have to say as a former county chair, that would have been huge for me because let me think what it was, oh yes, zero before. So um, that's quite a difference. So I am really hoping that we'll get at least another 100 new members and if you're not a member, um, most of you are, thank you very much. Please, please do join. It just um, really, every little bit counts and helps us really build the party. Um, Jim Ramsey, who is co-chair along with uh, Mary Sullivan of our uh, fundraising committee, has um, introduced a, an exciting new initiative, which you all should well, I hope that most of you know about it, but if not, I'm gonna tell you right now briefly, and that's our ambassadors program. And as a new chair, I think Jim kind of looked around and said, wow, there's a lot to this chair job to do it right. And there's a real need to um, focus on bringing money into the county and into the party as a state. And so uh, what Jim proposed and we eagerly embraced immediately was the idea of an ambassador program, whereby each county, um, someone will step up who is willing to be a, a really that um, go-between between the state, our, our fundraising committee, they'll actually come to the, you know, they'll, they'll be representative, they'll come to our meetings, and they'll bring the information back to their counties, and they will be the person who really um, is the cheerleader and pushes fundraising at the county level and helps us in every way to make sure that we have what we need the strength to really um, mount very, very strong campaigns and, and be such a strong player in this important election season. Um, I'm pleased that four counties have already stepped up. We have um, in Bennington is John, I'm gonna say your name wrong, Nybish, um, Chittenden, Terry Lefebvre, Orange, Billy Gosh, Windsor, our first one, Sandy Conrad. So thank you very much. And I hope the rest of you will be able to come up with an ambassador in the next um, month or so. And uh, this is going to be just a terrific addition to um, how we strengthen the party. Curtis Hoff dinner. I have been looking over the previous files and each time, you know, there was this planning, planning, and then uh, it stopped and went, virtual. We are not going to do that this time. Knock on wood. <laughs> we are having the Curtis Hoff dinner. We're hosting it. Our uh, major annual fundraiser will be Saturday, May 7th. Um, it's going to be in South Burlington at the Doubletree, which many of us know as the former Sheraton. We are seeking sponsors now. 
Um, I really want to put out the challenge to every county to have at least one table. Um, the invites will be coming soon. And I think today, actually, you're going to get a really nice looking save the date. So you'll know that several of us are already working on sponsors. And that's really important. If anyone can be a, a, a sponsor, that's that's really how we um you know, make the money on this and thank all of you, you know, are able to thank you who, if you're able to step up and do that. Um, so I'm not going to go over the, the prices and all that. Now you can certainly um, email me, but in another, uh, yeah, we, we are calling sponsors. If you're interested in being a sponsor, uh, Billy Gosh, Mary Sullivan and I, or Jim Ramsey, you can call any of us and we will be happy to sign you up. And uh, we will be having, uh, we'll be sending out invitations uh, virtually in the next, uh, in about a week. And um, I know many of you are going to, the next question is, who is the speaker? Who is the speaker? Uh, David Glidden has been working very hard on this. And we, I think, are very close to nailing down a speaker. We're not there yet. This seems to kind of be the story of Curtis Hoff. I remember this um, in the past, and it's, you know, it, it, it may happen again that we don't quite have the speaker confirmed when we send out the invite, but we will have someone great coming. And we are talking to um, a few excellent uh, possibilities. Um, anybody else who's working on this, is there anything else I need to add about this at this point, other than we can't wait to see you all there? Oh, and of course, there will be a chairs, um, uh, a chair's cocktail hour, a chair's reception for a bit more money, um, which again, helps us really, um, uh, gives us such a good start to this campaign season. Um, um, yes. I'll just add, we are doing a silent auction again. Um, yes. So if you have items you want to uh, add to that or a county basket, so your county chair should be aware that we're preparing to do county baskets again. But if you have something you want to highlight from your county, talk to your county chair. And if you want something uh, to go in the silent auction, talk to the wonderful Sherry Merrick. Mm -hmm. Yes, Sherry Merrick is has been organizing this um, for so long, and I am so grateful that she stepped up again, because where would we be without you, Sherry? And um, Sherry will be working directly with your county chairs. And in the, you know, when there's ambassadors, the ambassador will be the, uh, the, the, the person who will be um, uh, handling that. And uh, we also have um, Kathy Hall from uh, Rutland County who stepped up to help with the baskets which is great. I mean, Sandy Gartner, I'm sorry, Sandy Gartner, which is wonderful. Um, moving on. Uh, I spoke in the last meeting about uh, the equity, diversity, justice, and inclusion um, uh, coalition, and that um, we were looking at kind of uh, revisiting that and thinking about how to do things um, differently. We're very grateful for all the work that those folks did and they really set um, a basis for, for us going forward. Um, we had our first meeting of what I called the EDGY um, Advisory Committee. And um, I wanna um, give big thanks to the folks who stepped up for that. Asher Edelson, Brenda Churchill, Myra Erickson, Angela Lawrence, and Mimi Smythe. Um, this is important enough work that both, uh, all three, uh, David, Claire, and, and I were on this meeting also. We just had it recently. Um, we're first um, going to, um, several people volunteered to have a group agreement. And uh, this group agreed that, um, as I've learned from other states, that having affinity caucuses really makes sense and gives folks a place where they feel comfortable, welcome, and the folks who um, they identify with understand better how to um, bring, you know, people who have uh, the the same uh, qualities in common. How to how to bring them into leadership? How to create a bridge so that we in the Democratic Party are, are more welcoming? And um, affinity caucuses. Um, in many states, there are up to five, six, seven. We will probably start with a few. We already know and have support for a Black caucus and a disability caucus and other ideas. And we are asking for folks who would like to lead these. If, if you want to lead one, then, then we will make it happen. Um, so possibilities are a woman's caucus, 
an LGBTQA caucus, um, possibly a rural caucus. Um, if there's a people interested in having a Hispanic or Latino caucus, um, or a um, many states have Asian and Pacific Islander caucus, uh, we are there for you. So that's what we're exploring now. And um, we at the Democratic uh, party, our job is to really make sure that these folks have the resources, that we publicize these, that we um, provide some guidance and training. And uh, we're very excited. And it's um, really a great group and a great need for the Vermont Democratic Party. This is something that I feel has been, I and others feel has been lacking. And it's going to strengthen all of us. Um, so I'm really excited and grateful for these folks who've stepped up. And if you would like to be part of this, you can um, you can let me know. Um, we are pairing that with training in DEI and we really have a pretty exciting um, plan ahead, which I will uh, leave to Claire to talk about in her executive director's report, um, which I think we can go to now. Claire, take it away and um, just, uh, just so you know, at 10 o'clock, we will be welcoming our um, congressional candidates to speak. But um, Claire, I think you'll probably be able to make it through uh, most or all of your report. Just hoping. Um, wouldn't we like that? So as Anne said, it has been um, quite a couple, couple months since we last met. Apologies in advance. I have lost my voice. Um, I lost it in DC and I think I accidentally left it there. So I'll try and speak up. Um, but some really great things have been happening uh, here at the party. Um, we've been able to think about or finish our annual plan, um, which I hope you all had a chance to take a look at. Um, but we also have been able to start to plan really sincerely about our coordinated campaign, as David said. Um, with that in mind, uh, the DNC invested in our party for the coordinated campaign. Um, we are being allotted what's called a SPIF grant, um, State Party Innovation Fund, which is a grant funding program to invest in people power. Um, and what we will be doing is uh, hiring a coordinated campaign director. Yay. And I'm, I'm so excited. So we've got a lot of work to do and we want to get started early on our coordinated campaign um, to make sure that we do win all those races. So I... I am so excited to have a new friend in the office, um, but I'm also excited for all of you um, to get to have someone to work with on the ground. Um, next thing, we also have uh, other hires. Um, and if we haven't introduced you yet, I hope that you do have a chance to get introduced to them soon. Um, we have Sally working as the Senate caucus aide, um, doing some great work to support the, the senators uh, working right now on their fundraiser. She's just Doing all, all great things for them. Um, we brought Maddie on, uh, who you'll hear from shortly, who's our new data director. Um, I'm overjoyed. Maddie is helping to just organize everything um, so that we have, we're really able to campaign efficiently and effectively. So thank you, Maddie. Um, and then the House recently made an offer. Um, I haven't heard fully and completely um, if the person is, is coming up to Vermont, but I will let you know as soon as uh, I do. Um, that person will be working to support um, the representatives in the state house, but also to help them win their elections in November. Um, other ones that we are looking to hire, other positions, we will be looking, we, or we have advertised for a fundraising director um, and also for a communications director. I encourage you to uh, reach out to your networks. Um, you know, if you know folks that might be a good fit, please send them our way or for the coordinated campaign director. All of those postings can be found on our website. Um, it's just vtdemocrats.org uh, slash jobs. So please send those far and wide. Um, on that note, uh, with, with the campaigns coming up, um, because we do need those positions, um, and do you want me to turn it over to Maddie right now? Yeah, I think that's fine. Okay, great. Sorry, I misunderstood. So actually, I'm going to pause there, um, drink some tea, and let Maddie give a short presentation um, on the work she'll be doing uh, with all of you. Maddie is our data director. Maddie. Yes, all right. Yeah. Maddie is our data director, and I'm very excited that she's on the team. 
Awesome. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, Anne. And it is super nice to be joining all of you. I've had the pleasure of meeting several of you uh, already, and I'm excited um, to meet those that I haven't had the opportunity to work with yet. Um, as, as Claire said, my name is Maddie. I'm the new uh, data director at the VDP, and I come from a background of both data and organizing. Um, and so I'm really here to be a resource to support the organizing programs of our town, county, and candidate levels all across the state. Um, my, my background was originally from the Sarah Gideon campaign in 2020, and then I went and worked on the runoffs in Georgia and spent 2021 working in Virginia. I am super excited to be back working in the New Eng in New England. I just absolutely love it. So I'm super excited to be joining the team. Uh, Claire asked me to join this call to both introduce myself, but also talk a bit about what I've been doing in my first month with the VDP and our plans um, for improving data here in Vermont. And a lot of that work has revolved around preparing Vote Builder or VAN for the upcoming election cycle. So for, for those of you who might not be familiar, Vote Builder Van, I use those words interchangeably, um, is the party's database of the voter file. And it contains just really invaluable information for our party and our campaigns from election history to historic support for candidates from past election cycles to contact information for voters in, in every precinct in the state, every single voter here. Um, and it helps us target which voters we want to reach and how we want to reach those um, and even, you know, what issue might be most important to reach those voters on. So it is really kind of the, the critical part of our, our organizing program. You could have the best organizers in the world, but if they're not reaching out to the right people, um, then, you know, we're not taking advantage <laughs> of, of all of the great organizing work that they do. So my goal for the last month and continuing forward has been to make sure our VDP van has the most accurate information possible and that that information is accessible to you all and for our candidates to use this year. Um, so I'm going to share my screen and show you a bit about what that looks like. I've built out over the last month a, a resource library um, that will be a kind of go-to place for, for all of our candidates and for you all as you continue um, to use VAN or start using VAN this year. Um, and I've, I've built out some of it now, but as you can see, I'm continuing to write new articles in this resource library every day. But this one document and the folder that it lives in will contain all of the information that we have on VAN in the state and how to use it to the best of our organizing ability. So starting off with our, our weekly Vote Builder one-on-one -on -one training, if you've joined, great. If you haven't yet, I highly encourage you to come. It's an hour on Wednesday evenings and we walk through everything we need to do um, and use in VAN. We'll be launching a VAN 102 training to really dig into the weeds of how to use that information to organize even better. Um, and then really starting from the basics. How do you gain access to VAN? What is it? How do you navigate around VAN once you first um, use it? And then some more advanced usages in VAN. So this resource I will share out with everyone after this call over email and my contact information as well. But I'm really excited to be bringing this to you all um, and continuing to expand it out over the course of this year. I'm also excited to just be a resource as a person for you all. Um, I host bi-weekly, twice-weekly office hours on Tuesdays at noon and Thursdays at five so um, that I can be available and accessible to anyone in the state that has questions on van or data or targeting. Um, and so please hop in. I'll send out that link in my follow-up email as well. Um, I'd love to see you all. And if you have questions, I'm sure there are other folks that have those same questions and those office hours are really great opportunity to come together and to answer those questions. Um, and my last plug, as I said, Van is, is one of our great, our party's greatest tools. It's, it's really the, the heart and center of our organizing. So if you're speaking with a candidate for any office level, or you're thinking about how you want to organize in your own community, um, and you want access to the voter file, please either send candidates my way or contact me. Um, I will get them set up with an account that gives them all of the data that they need uh, for their specific campaign 
or organizing program um, and know how to use it to run that campaign successfully. So um, please I use me as a resource. I'm really excited to be here. Thank you so much uh, for your time. And uh, with that, I will pass it back to either Claire or Anne, whoever is up. I, I just wanna say, did we make a great hire or what? <laughs> Maddie is um, both uh, knowledgeable, a people person, eager, enthusiastic, and uh, kind of unstoppable. So Maddie, we're just so glad to have you here. And uh, I, I really hope that everyone will take advantage of her, her great skills. And, uh, you know, to, to see her is to, to get why we, why we have her on board. Um, back to you, Claire. Thank you. And I'll just, I'll definitely, um... Just give myself a little pat on the back because Maddie really is terrific. So um, just, yeah, echoing what Anne said, we're really, really lucky to have um, such a talented data director and please go to the trainings, take her up on her offer of office hours. Um, it's well worth it. I've learned a ton myself already. Um, so just a couple more things, speaking of training, um, we have uh, had some great conversations, like Anne said, with um, folks at these the DNC and the uh, ASDC meetings um, and about how to implement DEI training. Um, I know that we've really all been talking about it a lot and wanting to schedule it. And we have a, a set of eight training modules um, that are done through Google Classroom that come with additional um, kind of reflections, discussions um, that are facilitated um, by, you know, ourselves, um, but really helping us to kind of do that deep dive um, into, you know, DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion trainings. Thank you, Deb. Um, but uh, that's going to be done uh, in addition to the work with, with the EDGY Coalition. Um, so we're very excited about those. I'm just kind of ironing out uh, a few more details with the folks at the Best Practices Institute on getting our classroom set up. Um, and then once that is, uh, we'll be scheduling um, both discussions and also I'll be sending out all of the information for you to um, start to work through the modules. Um, so stay tuned on that. Um, and then last but not least, um, wanted to just talk through uh, some of the annual plan. Um, and I'm, I'm really excited about the work that we're going to be doing together. Um, and I'm just sorry, my computer is not responding. Um, anyway, I can talk about it. I've been, um, but I'm really excited by the work that we're going to be doing together as a state party um, to not only build our organization, but also to help support the campaigns and make sure that we're well equipped to run good election or good campaigns at every level. So a big part of what our annual plan is um, set up to be is, is based in that organizational development, the volunteer training, the, the work that we're doing to um, build our, our town and county committees larger, to have a better presence in our communities. Um, and so we're really gonna lean into working through it ourselves, um, basing a lot of the work that we're doing through our subcommittees and ensuring that you know, we're able to bring our platform um, to every town in Vermont and elect people in every town. So we have broken it apart into four main strategies, um, which is which are uh, to train the town and county committees to be effective campaigners, to carry out year round outreach and engagement, to conduct comprehensive voter education, and to prepare and carry out an, an aggressive voter turnout program. Um, as you can see, it, it doesn't really matter what we're doing. We're just organizing and organizing and organizing, um, making sure that we have all of those together. Um, but our subcommittees are going to be a big part of that because we want to organize ourselves. So the, for example, the field and grassroots organizing committee is going to be working on building out trainings, finding folks um, on the ground who can help share out the skills we need. Um, message and communications committee is going to be working with us to build out some targeted messaging. So um, what's Asha used to say something like, if you're talking to everyone, you're talking to no one. And we're kind of, we want to make sure that what we bring into our communities in terms of messaging and communications is what's important to those people there. Um, voter education and voter turnout, those are pretty standard. With universal vote by mail, though, we will need to um, 
we will need to have some um, aspect of voter outreach and education because there are some people who did not vote even though they got mailed a ballot last year. And we wanna make sure that everyone who can and should be voting is voting. Um, I'm gonna stop there and see if anyone has any questions. I think the way that we're going to do this actually is we're going to go ahead and since since this body is going to approve this action plan, we'll ask for the motion to approve it in a second and then the discussion. So if we can uh, get a motion to approve and please say your name. Steve Amos, uh, motion to approve. Thank you. Pastor and Edelson, second. Great. And we're now open to discussion, which includes um, questions for Claire and for us. And, and I have to say that, um, you know, when, when, I, when I looked at it, I said, oh, action plan do. Oh, darn, another thing on my plate. This actually was an incredible experience for us to come together as a team and really think through what does it mean to be the Vermont Democratic Party? What are our aims? What's our vision? What's our mission? And how do we get there? And once we came up with these four areas, they almost filled themselves in because we were able to just look at what, you know, what do we need? What do we have? What has been done in the past? What do we wanna do differently, better? We brought it to the executive committee. They had some um, really nice ideas to, to um, kind of strengthen and build it up, which Claire has added. And I'm pretty proud of this and, and especially proud of Claire who really did um, an awful lot of the work. But, um, Take it from there. Are there questions, discussion? And of course, um, as you dig deeper and if you're on a subcommittee, um, please feel free to come to Claire and you know, ask, you know, what do you mean by this? What are you doing about this? Can I help out on this area? Um, especially counties, um, how do we play this game? We'd be very happy to have you um, engaged in this. So I'm gonna give us another minute, not even a minute, another short, short time here. And- um, Ryer has a question. Okay, oh good, I didn't see that. Okay, Ryer. Hi, thank you. Um, so my question uh, is about quarter one. In quarter one, there's the um, bullet point that is, hold on, sorry, I just lost it. Um, provide diversity, equity, and inclusion training for effective outreach into underrepresented communities. <clears throat> I'm wondering if um, the term outreach um, might be replaced by something that um, doesn't make it feel um, like, a, <laughs> I, I don't want to, I, I mean, I don't think the intention is to to use people, but when you, that, that phrasing makes it seem like it's about like using those communities. So I'm wondering if it, a term wouldn't be effective um, inclusion of underrepresented communities or something like that, just to um, really drive home the point that it's about getting these groups involved. I love the idea of inclusion of, and thank you. This is why we, we asked for, for folks, um, voices on these documents. I, I like that and am happy to make the change. I think it's much a much better way um, to say what we really are talking about. Yeah, and inclusion is, it, it's nice because it goes way beyond outreach. It's, it's a two-way street, which is, I think, what you're also aiming at. So that's great. Other suggestions or questions? And Susan Borden here. I like David's idea. David Glidden in the chat has suggested collaboration. And I think that's even more active in a way than inclusion and more two-way, but you might just think about that. Ryer, do you have a response to that? Um, I, I would just suggest that um, I like the idea of collaboration, but I don't think the idea is to um, collaborate with these groups. I think it's more to listen to what these groups have to say and include their feedback into the thing. So while that feels like collaboration, I mean, I guess either way would be okay, but I think collaboration tends to feel like it's, we're putting both sides up for a debate in terms of like including other people, which is bringing their views into our own views, if that makes sense. 
Uh, I can see that it, to me, collaboration, listening to you, collaboration seems to be kind of a subset of inclusion. It's one part of inclusion. And inclusion is maybe a stronger term that is a broader term that that, that also okay. covers collaboration, if that's okay with that's you. That's fine. I just wanted to make sure everybody saw David's. Yeah, no, that's a good point. And David, does that make uh, sense to you? Absolutely. Okay. Anything else? And I, I, I can't see you. Uh, Abby Blaine. Hi. Hi, yes. So yeah. I just want to make sure our plan totally lines up with some of the recently passed legislation around ballot curing. And I think it would be really helpful to have a town clerk outreach strategy, um, probably in Q3, in addition to having really a um, I would say strategic, if possible, ballot curing strategy within um, GOTV. So just something to add, this is new to our state. Um, I worked very closely with the teams on the ground in Michigan and Georgia that had, in 2020 that had really built out ballot curing programs. Um, so just something to keep in mind, and we might want to, I'm sure the campaign coordinated campaign director will have some experience in this, or if not, there'll be lots of resources, but we might want to get it down in writing in the plan, if possible. Just, just to make sure everybody understands ballot curing, my understanding is that if ballots come in and they're incomplete or missing information, there's the opportunity to, um, the town clerk can um, let that folks know and they they have the opportunity to correct them and get them in on time. And, you know, I don't even know what the, um, how, you know, to what extent that's allowed in Vermont. Does someone... It is allowed with the new um, vote by mail law that was passed with all ballots being sent. It was a key part of that new legislation. Um, and we should just look into it. But normally as a part of it, that information is publicly available. Anyone that has ballots that need to be cured and volunteers can play an active role of reaching out to voters who need their ballots cured. So just just flagging that as something to consider. So uh, I, go ahead, Claire. To that point. Um, that's just like, a, it's not in the bullet point. That's just in a, an included part in voter education. Like we will uh, need to be doing that. Do you mean specifically like the network of like tracking ballot, like neat ballots and be cured? Cause that's just, that is part of the like overall or will be overall part of the field plan. Totally. It just, I think we just want to keep it. Um, I don't think you need to change the plan and it can be approved as is, but I think we just want to spend extra time and care with it because this is brand new legislation that we'll be implementing in our GOTV strategy. Abby, I think that's good for all of us to hear right now as we think about what we are going to be doing going, going forward. So even though Claire knew that, we probably didn't all know that. So yeah, that's a great thing to so be prepared as we um, roll this out, ballot curing will be a really important part. And I know, I mean, I, my understanding is it truly made a difference um, in, in some other states like Georgia. So that's great. Susan, is your hand, let's see. Susan Borden, did you have something else? I'm sorry, I forgot to lower my hand okay. right now, sorry. All right, anyone else? Um, just make sure there's, yeah. All right, so um, we are, now I'm gonna go back to my notes to make sure I get this right. So um, he, we will make the change that was proposed and uh, hearing no other amendments to the plan, we will um, now vote by voice vote. Um, all in favor of approving the annual action plan, uh, yay. Yeah. I could have said I. Yay. 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 All opposed, nay. And um, the plan is uh, passed. And uh, that's great because this is really our marching orders. And we are looking, it, it, Claire has already really been using this to, to build out what we're going to be doing um, quarter to quarter. It's actually, it's, for once, this is a real plan. I mean, I don't mean that this wasn't in other places, but um, I've certainly been on nonprofit boards where we um, build those plans and they sit on the shelf. And this is um, definitely not one of those. So um, good work to all of us who were involved in this. Excellent. Okay. Um, we are still 10 minutes away from um, 
the exciting presentations we're going to have. So I think that we can go ahead, um, Deb, and start with the treasures report. And I'm gonna suggest that maybe you do the, um, save the annual budget for after um, the uh, candidates speak, because you'll have time to do the PL and and uh, the other issue uh, beforehand, but it's up to you. So take it away, Deb. Okay, I'm just really quickly putting in chat. Um, oh, I don't want this to go to Bob though. Thank you, Bob. Um, the um, just a, just an order of business. The uh, PDF of the profit and loss got sort of munged by Google, and so I went ahead and made a um, uh, made another posted put another document in my drive, and there's a direct link to it. And everyone who's on this call should be able to open that with no Thank problem. You. Okay. Um, gosh, all of these prompts. Okay. Um, as you know, Noah uh, and my uh, responsibility that we're charged with is making sure that for state party activities uh, that we have the money to carry these things out and keeping an eagle eye on what's being spent. Um, so I'm going to keep an eye also on the clock and um, and since we're doing the budget last for the vote, we'll see if we get there or not um, before the uh, before the <laughs> candidates come. Um, the first I just want to mention really quickly on compliance reporting, we successfully uh, filed our state uh, uh, compliance report on the 15th when it was due. And at the same time, I created a chart of the counties and kind of went in and looked and see what counties um, had filed reports, had registered and filed reports. And in that outreach, um, I was able to, with a couple of counties, assist them in getting their, their systems done. Others had no trouble. They had a long history. And the main thing was, did people change uh, county treasurers? And was that information passed through to the new county treasurer as to how to do this process? Uh, did you have a login and so forth? So, um, um, we still have uh, four to five counties, I haven't checked the last one, um, that are still having a little bit of difficulty. And uh, once JP Isabel has, has recovered from this big filing system in the state, I'm going to meet with him again and determine with those four or five counties the best way to circumvent the lack of login and that sort of thing. Um, so we can, the goal being that every county that needs to file that has that money moving through them is compliant. Um, okay. Um, also, um, our leadership team and our compliance reporter, Chris Patton, have worked diligently on resolving the FEC problem that we had that we reported earlier. We weren't sure, it was, I, I wanna call it a reporting concern because it seemed like an irregularity. Uh, and uh, the reason for the discrepancy, it turns out that there was an erroneous reporting in third quarter of 2018. We reported this to our executive committee just a couple of days ago, where the compliance reporting uh, that the party had at the time entered amount in a section of the report. It shouldn't have been there. So it kicked back as being a, a slightly over $50,000 discrepancy, but at no time was there ever a discrepancy. It was just a paperwork thing. So, and the way he's determined that is he is looking looking through not only third quarter, but fourth quarter of 2018 forensically, there's been no offset, which is a good thing. So um, um, out of compliance is simply a notation error. And at this point, there's, there are no extra funds. There's nothing we're hiding. Um, I just wanted to bring you up to date on that. Okay. Um, if you have um, by now access the p &L, and again, I apologize that there was the uh, you're welcome, Jim. Um, the PL also, um, and I'm we're going to be developing probably a better way of looking at uh, a cash budget. Thank you, Jim Ramsey, for that input. Um, and let me just say really quickly, um, as I as I close in on this, uh, I, we have two amazing people uh, that are on our our budget and finance committee, along with the rest of us, that really keep us on our toes. And so we're going to continue to refine our reporting for the state party for the state committee. Um, so our P&Ls for January and February, if you look at the bottom line, it looks like a loss, um, but in large part, it's because we're paying, we were paying back bills. We anticipate being totally caught up in the admin expenses by the beginning of the new fiscal year, which is April 1. 
Um, and another way to look at it is that our net change in our bank account only went down by $8,000 in the admin accounts. Okay, so if you see a minus 19,000 on the, on the profit and loss for the two months, that's just really because the way the accounting is working out, we did uh, inherit um, some uh, things that hadn't been paid. Everything is now current. I'm glad to report to you. And, uh, and we've all worked hard. I've had tremendous support from Claire and Ann and Noah on getting that done. Um, we also um, um, have been, as we're going along, we're, develop, we're implementing systems for every activity connected with running of the admin budget so that everybody's on board with this and um, logging all our revenues and our expenditures ourselves, in addition to our awesome compliance reporter um, who has his own record on that. So that's really the end of, uh, of my reporting. If you wanna take a look at the budget and then listen to our congressional um, right. people, right? Yeah. And then after that, I'll come back on and and we'll we'll you'll go over the annual budget and and I'll go over the annual budget and we'll have a vote on it right yeah so um well I um I first want to take one minute because we have one minute before we start um to just applaud Deb she's giving a lot of credit to others but Deb has been amazing from the minute she hit the ground when when she says we're developing systems and processes. Deb is developing these systems and processes, and she is absolutely looking to Chris, looking to some you know terrific members we have on our um, budget and finance committee, and sharing with Claire and and me. But I just feel like um, Deb has just really put her nose to the grindstone, and also not only Deb do you have the um, ability and skills, but you're really great at explaining things to us making sure we understand and making sure that you know we're not doing this in the dark by any means it's very open it's very transparent and i think you can see that just in her presentation today so um we all really owe a debt of gratitude for you to you for um uh for all the work you're doing um it's many hours a week and um just so you know we're, we've kind of started a um plan of um Post, post COVID, I hope this continues, um, of, of coming into the office um, every Tuesday. And that's been a really great way for us to all sort of connect and um, have, um, you know, Deb has gone over these systems with me, help me understand, and it's just really um, helps clarify things. So, so Deb, thank, thanks so much. Um, we are now at 10 o'clock and um, I am so excited to welcome our candidates for Congress. Um, we've asked them to give a really lengthy speech. Oh, I mean, five minutes. <laughs> so that's actually harder, I think, uh, that what we've done because, um, you know, we want to uh, get you out of here by 11 o'clock or so. So we are, um, it, it's a real challenge, I think, for these candidates um, who have uh, so much to talk about. We've, we've actually, we, we're asking them to each talk for five minutes. And, um, just so you know, um, I think we all know that we've welcomed a new um, primary candidate this week, Shanae Chase Clifford, who joins Becca Ballant, Molly Gray, and Keisha Ram Hinsdale. And they are all here, I believe, and they've all agreed to share with us. So um, to make it fair, what I decided was I was going to pick names out of a hat. Yesterday was so warm and so spring-like that I got inspired and took out my bike helmet. So that's the hat we're gonna use. So I've put their names in little slips and without looking, I'm going to pick out, pick the first one and just um, how this will work is um, once I have the name, I will um, you know, introduce you, uh, just say your name. We don't, th these folks really don't need introductions at this time. You've done a very good job introducing yourselves to, um, our state and um then uh we will uh we will time you and at, at four minutes um you'll be told one minute left and at 30 seconds 30 seconds left because i know it's hard to keep track while you're talking and then we'll move on to the next one so drum roll please first up we are going to welcome let's see <laughs> it's hard to get out of the out of this all right we have Molly Gray. 
So um, I did get a note saying that Molly might be about five minutes late. Is Molly here? Sam, do you know? No, and she is- Okay, so Mo we'll have Molly go second. Okay. So um, we will um, have, Shanae, you are up first. Shanae Chase Clifford, our newest candidate for Congress. Um, hello, welcome. Hi there, hi there. And um, you may take it away and we look forward to hearing so from you. As I, as I told you, we'd like to know um, why you're running and if elected, what are some of your top priorities? So take it away, Shanae. Great. Well, I, I also I knew I was going to go first. <laughs> I am, I am really excited uh, to to being virtual community with you all. There's there's many folks I'm super excited to meet. But um, yeah, my name is Shanae Chase Clifford, and that's how you pronounce my first name for for folks who are unfamiliar. Shanae, um, and I was I was born and raised in Vermont. And I know uh, in this past week, so you have you know uh, maybe heard a little bit about my story, but um, I'd love to share just a little bit before I dive into. Uh, the things I'm really excited to talk about, which is which is policy. Um, but yeah, I grew up in Essex and I went through Essex Town Public Schools. And, you know, I have what I like to think is a very common Vermont story uh, for, for better or for worse. I think my story is one that so many Vermonters can relate to. And I say for better because, you know, throughout our history, um, you know, even since the days of the Underground Railroad, Vermont has always been a place where folks who are persecuted and are seeking refuge and are looking for a home have been able to find one. Um, and that's so central to my family's story. My parents met when my dad joined the Peace Corps. Um, my mom was from Liberia and was living in Monrovia supporting her family and um, her three boys, my brothers at the time. And they, they met and got married and my dad overstayed his Peace Corps assignment and was all set up to, to live and, and to work there. He had a job set up with the UN and Knowing my parents like I do, they were probably going to stay there. <laughs> they probably would would still be there now if it weren't for um, the Liberian Civil War that started in um, 1989, in the winter of 1989. Um, and that's a conflict that took that spanned probably about 15 years, 12 in active conflict, um, taking nearly 250,000 lives, um, displacing hundreds and thousands of more, um, including my family, and leaving. Um, a wake of trauma that still reverberates in that nation and within the lives of those displaced. Um, so Vermont was literally my parents, you know, place of refuge. You know, we, we still have the letters from then Senator Jeffords that uh, his office wrote on behalf of my family to embassies and, and wrote personally to my mom saying that, you know, he hoped she could find peace after really um, unimaginable circumstances. So that's very much my own story, but it's also, I think, very much a story of Vermont's capacity to care and love folks. Um, and I think that's a story that many know well. But as I said, uh, it's a quintessential Vermont story for better or for worse. And it's also, uh, you know, after my family found that place, it became incredibly dif dif difficult. Uh, for my family, for my family to sustain a life here. Uh, my parents were supporting a number of family members, which certainly stretched us emotionally and financially very thin. And there were um, a lot of months where we just could not make the ends meet. Um, and that made us different enough. But uh, on top of that, there is the intersection of the incredible racism I both experienced and witnessed my other family members experience. And, you know, in in total, as much as I absolutely with my whole heart, love this state and love where I'm from. Um, there have been many times where I felt like Vermont just simply did not love me back. And um, that's exactly why I'm running. Um, as, I've, as I've returned home, I've heard young people say that they feel like their school environments are harmful and they don't have the support that they need. Um, we've all seen the violence that has pushed black women out of politics in our state. And we have seen folks from all life, all walks of life leave our state because they can't afford to live here. Um, and unfortunately, I think within my story, there's a lot of those common threads that so many Vermonters share. And it takes someone who knows exactly what it's like to grow up here, like one I minute. did. And, oh, sorry, which, which number was that two or one? One minute. Oh, geez, Louise. Um, <laughs> to, to go up here to fight for the solutions that I think center that experience most. 
And um, I, it's, that, it's with that perspective that I would hope to take to Congress and to ensure that every person has access to safe, affordable, dignified housing. And very much, we know that because housing is at the core of our communities, when we invest in housing, we invest in education, we invest in childcare, we invest in public safety and immigration policy and economic security. Um, and so how is it when we, we, oh, my. 30 seconds. Okay. Oh, okay, I'm like wasting time just asking you. Um, and I also would hope to ensure that we can shift the burden of combating climate catastrophe from the shoulders of working families onto those who most exploit our labor and most exploit our climate. And to ensure that everything that we do is trauma responsive and is centering our centering care and compassion. And you know, I really understand the both and of this Vermont experience and tired of it's tricky. It's a tricky one. Good luck, everybody. Uh, right. It was really nice to five to minutes. Chat with you all. Very, very short, but um, thank you very much. Um, so I, uh, I think that Molly still might not be here. I know she was really planning to be and apparently had um, an unexpected conflict that's keeping her. I haven't seen her enter yet. So I'm going to pick the next name. Um, and next we have Keisha. Keisha Ram Hinsdale, who is here. Thank, thanks Keisha, so much, Anna. Take it away. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. I hope I'm not breaking protocol by being on video. It's just uh, nice to see other faces, I think. So, Anna, I'm going to do a lot of looking at you unless others want to turn their video on as well. Uh, for those of you who may not know me as well, though I see lots of familiar names, I'm Senator Keisha Ram Hinsdale, and I'm running for Congress to be Vermont's fighter for our working families, our democracy, and our climate. Uh, as some of you know, my story begins sweeping peanut shells off the floor in my Indian immigrant father and Jewish American mother's Irish pub. So happy St. Patrick's Day and happy Holy to all of you. <laughs> These are two holidays that I've always celebrated and sometimes Easter is a little closer uh, to Holy. But, um, you know, that is uh, that shaped my early life growing up in my family business and pitching in in the community. Um, but that's not where the story ended. Um, my father, after the business fell apart and my parents' marriage fell apart, um, you know, my father really loved food service, but I think that was also an excuse for not being able to afford to retire. Um, and ultimately, he passed away holding a catering tray in his hands at a Silicon Valley gala. Um, and that has always, <clears throat> you know, that happened while I was serving in the legislature and was, uh, you know, a, a particularly poignant turning point for me to ensure that uh, working families have the dignity that they need through all chapters of life, uh, including the ability to retire uh, with dignity. And so as some of you may know, my foray into the Democratic Party in Vermont was quite early. Um, you know, I have always felt that uh, the, the right to vote um, was something that those before me who looked like me fought for, lost opportunity over, and in some cases lost their lives over. So I've been politically active for a long time, have always uh, thought of it as important to vote from local elections to federal elections. And um, I think that was noticed when 16 years ago, uh, Senator, then, then Congressman Bernie Sanders, then Senate pro tem Peter Welch uh, were running for the open congressional and Senate seats in 2006 in Vermont. And when they went to kick off their event, um, they had a, they wanted to have a rock star, you know, Senator join them um, who they asked someone from Illinois to come. And um, they knew that they really needed to have a student kick off the event because the event was at UVM. So they asked me and I talked about student debt and climate change and things that would ultimately be decided on our backs if we weren't at the table. Um, you know, I sort of sat back down and was pretty proud of myself, but it went on down the line until this rock star senator from Illinois got up and said, you know, I have a father from Kenya and a mother from Kansas. And I thought, huh, I have a father from India and a mother from Illinois. And I've never heard a story like this in American politics. Funny name, no one could pronounce. Check, check, check. And then he turned to Bernie and he said, you know what, Bernie, if you don't behave yourself, we're going to run Keisha for the Senate instead of you. That was a great presentation. <laughs> I was a sophomore in college. It was the first time anyone encouraged me to run for office. And two years later, we would share a ballot. Uh, I would end up being one of the youngest legislators in the country. And as folks have probably gathered, he became the 44th president of the United States. Uh, and since then, um, I have been consistently the, uh, the same person in the legislature. 
Um, and I feel like in many ways, the reckoning that we've had by having a predator in the White House for four years in Donald Trump and watching a black man uh, who was murdered for nine and a half minutes over and over on television has really given Vermont an awakening that's helped me pass a lot of legislation um, that I have fought for for a long time. Um, so, you know, in my 10th year in the legislature, I'm proud to say the environmental justice bill that I introduced as a senior in college, um, the bill that I've been working on for 15 years, looks like it's finally going to pass next week in the Senate, which I'm greatly excited about. And my passion and uh, interest in climate justice and environmental justice is probably the reason that I have Bill McKibben's support in this race. One and just, minute. Great, and just earn the support of Sunrise Middlebury. Um, so I have some of the major climate endorsements in this race. My fight for teacher pension, standing on the state house steps with educators and state employees, um, as well as fighting for collective bargaining rights and for so many labor issues um, is probably also the reason I have the only labor endorsements in the race currently from the National Rural Letter Carriers Association and the Communication Workers of America. 30 seconds. And um, you know, my passion for voting rights and racial justice, I think is known to many of you. I was very proud to help found Emerge Vermont and the Bright Leadership Institute, um, recognizing that after Luvenia Dorsey Bright served as the first black woman in office, it took about two decades for me to enter the legislature and for us to have another woman of color in the legislature. And I'm proud to be the first woman of color in the state Senate. I don't take that for granted. I'm somebody who can dream big and deliver on that promise. And I'm asking you I'm to dream and deliver with me. Thank you so much. And it's a pleasure to be with all of you. Thank you very much, Keisha. Um, Becca Ballant. Mm. I am. Oh, good. I thought you were. <laughs> you got oh, me. Cool. It, all right. And Fantastic. Can... Welcome. Welcome Thank to you. the welcome to our uh, group here. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? Anyway, yes. Wonderful. Uh, very, very good morning to you all. Uh, I know many of you, but I wanted to share a little bit uh, about myself for those of you I've not yet met. So I'm Becca Ballant. I live here in Brattleboro. And before getting elected to the Senate, I was a middle school teacher, uh, history and social studies in four different rural public schools here in Vermont. Uh, I live in Brattleboro with my wife, Elizabeth, and our two kids, Abe, who's 14, and Sarah, who's 11. So I'm a parent. I'm a former teacher. I'm an experienced legislator, and I'm also a gay Vermonter, and I know what it feels like to be an outsider. I understand the struggles um, when you feel like you're on the outside of things looking in, and I understand the experience of families in our rural communities. The, the cost of housing right now is spiraling out of control. The cost of health care is too, and it's all happening in the midst of you know, drastic economic inequality and a severe climate crisis. So these huge problems threaten the future for all of our children and grandchildren and also for my own kids. So what this moment needs is someone with the experience to get things done and with the integrity and the commitment this nation expects when they think of Vermont. That's who I am and that's why I'm running for Congress. I decided to get into public service in large part due to my experience growing up. Uh, as many of you know, my grandfather was murdered in the Holocaust and this greatly impacted my view of the world and the work that needed to be done to prevent those horrors from happening again. And as I said, early on in my life, I knew that I was gay and I also knew in my body and in my heart that many of the people around me people in my community, people in the world who I loved uh, were very open with me that they felt that uh, being gay was wrong and that I should be ashamed of who I am. So that experience really shaped me as a teacher and also as a leader. You know, I, as I said, I know what it feels like to feel like you, you don't belong, that you're an outsider and to feel like you don't know if somebody's going to have your back. But instead of becoming bitter and angry and disconnected from my community, which so easily could have happened because of that loneliness and that fear, um, I set out to really live a life of service, a life of service and a life of kindness. And I decided to run for office because I realized that so many of my students were really struggling. Uh, they struggled with 
homelessness or tough situations at home. Uh, they struggled with their parents not being able to make their mortgage payments. They struggled with their siblings not being able to find you know, good paying jobs. So it's that sense of, you know, is this world gonna be there for me when I need it? And so as a teacher, I re have really tried to be that person for my students. And as a community member, I've tried to be that person. But I always wanted to do more. And I felt like my community needed some real change. So I decided to run for, for Senate because I think it's important that people who represent Vermont are completely rooted in supporting uh, the most vulnerable among us, that they're rooted in what's just and what's best for people in their communities. And people who understand that small communities truly are the backbone of the state. And as a Senator, I have a proven record of really delivering for Vermonters, big housing investments, strong reproductive rights, uh, paid sick days, childcare investments, protecting uh, the pensions of public employees. And I worked very, very hard to pass the first gun safety legislation in Vermont's history. And so now here we are with an open congressional seat and the stakes, as you all know, have never been higher for Vermont or for the nation. And I really believe that Vermont has long been the conscience of this nation. It's not been perfect. It's not been without missteps, but we've always tried to reach towards justice, towards a more equitable future. So what this moment requires, seconds. what this moment needs, yes? 30 seconds. 30 seconds, okay. What this moment needs is Vermont to lead once again with a person of integrity and the skills to get the hard work done in the quiet rooms to deliver for Vermonter. It's how I've led as a teacher, it's how I've led in my community, and as a Senator, it's how I will always lead. I hope to earn your support in the coming weeks and months. Uh, so please don't hesitate to reach out to my campaign for questions I'm, or comments. I hope sorry. you'll join me. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Um, I've had a request for um, all of the campaigns. If you are able to uh, go ahead and, and uh, put your uh, uh, campaign um, website into the uh, chat, box, chat room so people can find you. Um, that would be great. And um, Molly, uh, is, is Molly here? Yes, yay, Hi. okay, very good. Morning. All right, Molly, uh, we are ready for your five minutes um, in front of all of us, so thanks. Thank you. Good morning, Anne, and just to publicly recognize you and congratulate you on all of the incredible work you've been doing as our new chair, um, chair of the VDP, and also to all of the uh, VDP staff for all their hard work um, over the last year. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here this morning. I'm sorry, I'm a little bit delayed. I'm actually at CBU for a robotics competition with 16 awesome um, young teams from across the state. And it's just really, really exciting to see so many young people jazzed about STEAM and STEM. Um, but this is such an important moment for our state. As we all know, we get to write the next chapter for Vermont and the stakes are extremely high as we've um, heard this evening for, or this morning, excuse me, from a uh, number of candidates. Uh, I did wanna begin by just thanking everyone here, thanking the BDP for all the support. It's been such an honor to serve as your 82nd Lieutenant Governor, uh, to be a Democrat at a time where we're seeing so many rights across this country um, and, and key issues under attack, um, be it voting rights or reproductive rights, and that our leadership here in Vermont continues to be so strong. Uh, I look forward to continuing to focus this campaign on the issues that matter most to Vermonters. It's a lot of the work that I've been doing as Lieutenant Governor, focusing on workforce development and our demographic crisis, housing, childcare, um, the economic well being of Vermont's families, and uh, making sure that we're working every day to build a climate workforce and to take bold climate action here in Vermont. But the stakes are so high in this election. And I know right now already, Republicans are looking at Vermont with our uh, popular, very popular Republican governor and thinking, can we pick up this seat? So we have to make sure we send an extremely strong Democrat uh, into the general election that's ready, able, excited to win this race and to hold on to this seat for Vermont. 
My service to Vermont started long before serving as your Lieutenant Governor. For those of you who I'm meeting today, it actually began in 2006 when after graduating from UVM, I helped elect Congressman Welch and then moved to Washington to serve in his office. And I was literally there when we opened the door to 1404 Longworth and got to work building an office from scratch, building a process for meeting constituent service needs and making sure Vermonters had access to um, federal agencies and we could support the needs of Vermonters, be it small business loans or social security benefits. So I know what it's like to start an office from scratch. I also know what it's like to work across the aisle and work across chambers on really tough issues. Uh, in 2007, my younger brother enlisted in the US Marine Corps, it was the height of the Iraq war. And at the same time, Congress received those first reports of detainee abuse and torture at Guantanamo Bay, of um, a lack of weapons of mass destruction. We all remember that time. So I went to work for the International Committee of the Red Cross, an organization that works in places of conflict across the globe, including in Ukraine uh, today. And I was their Congressional Affairs Advisor, working with Senate Foreign Relations Committee and House Foreign Affairs, with the Armed Services Committees, um, working to bring members of Congress um, into meetings with the ICRC, but also bringing staff into the field, into Uganda, um, Haiti, the Western Balkans, and Georgia after Russia invaded South Ossetia and Abkhazia. So I also know what it's like to work on legislation, to work on really tough issues, and to bring people together to get things done. I've also lived and worked across Vermont. I was born in Newberry, where my folks and One minute. still farm today. I live in Burlington today with my husband. Uh, for a while, South Royalton and Tunbridge were my home, and also Rutland when I was clerking for the Second Circuit. Uh, when I was serving as an assistant attorney general, I lived and worked across the state. And what I know um, is that the issues facing Vermonters, a lot of the issues that I've also worked to navigate in my own life, trying to find affordable housing or apartment to rent, take care of a mother with multiple sclerosis without paid family and medical leave. And it's these challenges that get me out of bed every morning, keep me up at night. And it's what I'm excited about in serving as your next Congresswoman, working hard for Vermonters, representing every corner of our state, and making sure that on day one, we have a Congresswoman who's ready to lead, who's ready to get to work and who's ready to deliver for Vermont. So I sincerely hope I can earn your support. It's going to be an exciting race. We're building a team uh, each and every day. We'll share information on how to get involved in the chat, but I look forward to continuing to work with all of you and all the work we'll do together for Vermont in the days, weeks, and years to come. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Molly. So um, it was really, I think, uh, just terrific from here to hear from our candidates. Looks like we are going to be sending the first woman to Congress. And I will just repeat what Joanna Poisenberg wrote into the chat, because I'm right with you, Joanna. Although it is going to be hard to choose among these amazing women, I can't believe that we are so lucky to have such an incredible slate of candidates. And I think I can, I can let it go there. So um, yeah, thanks thanks so much, all of you, and for all of your hard work. And I think now in the chat, you can find a way to um, connect with all these candidates. And um, I see that another candidate has, has put um, their contact information. If there's any other statewide candidates, I think that's a really good idea right now. Put your statewide um, contact information in the chat. And of course, we will be hearing from other statewide candidates um, in our following meetings. So. Um, as I said, this is one exciting um, uh, primary campaign and boy, did I pick a great time to become chair. Um, so with that, we are going to go back to you, Deb. And um, if you could um, just give a quick review of the annual budget and we will then um, uh, as, a, as a state committee uh, we'll approve that. Um, sure, this is, going after all of those inspirational five minute speeches. That was pretty inspirational. Uh, this is, um, yeah, we're yeah, back we to We need the money to make sure that, you know, we <laughs> right. support them, right? We're back to the budget, folks. Um, so you've all had a chance, I hope, to look at the budget. And um, we're going to start with the bottom line. 
the bottom line on revenue and the bottom line on expenses are both in the uh, five five hundred fifty thousand dollar range you will see that we came as close as we could realistically to balancing the budget um one of the ways that we did that um is by um we looked at our revenue for uh it's under other fundraising the very first line revenue and please know that claire has uh found a couple of sources uh, amazing sources of ways of um raising money um, it's she's going to do an aggressive uh, digital campaign or be, you know, have have these people be part of it. And if you have questions, um, Claire can expand on that a little more. Um, and then the other way that we um, balance the budget is at the same time by outsourcing uh, through uh, through contracts, some of our fundraising, we are able to lower some of our of our salaries while still remain, I mean, our, our salaried people, while still remaining extremely responsible um, in, in the positions that Claire said, you know, that we're bringing on. So um, this budget matches um, uh, the planning that Claire and Anne and David have done. Um, and um, I guess I'm gonna open the floor at this point if there are any questions. Um, once we, or should we look for the motion first? Uh, we're, we're going to have a motion first. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm looking, we're looking, your chair is looking for a motion. Yeah. So yes, I'd like a motion right. to um, pass the annual budget. So moved. And a second. Oh, that, that was Edward Clark. Ed Clark. Second. Steve, Steve Amos, second. Very good. And it's now open for discussion and any questions for Deb and again, um, this is, this is, I want you to all know, this is a living document and things may change things. And Deb and Claire in particular have been really hard at work and working with the um, budget and finance committee to, to bring this up to speed because it, it already changed. It be, you know, we have lost some staff and we have gained some staff since we last spoke to you. And I have to say, I've become very, very familiar with our bylaws. And I was really pleased to see that the bylaws actually understand that this happens, it, it reflects understanding. And so we will approve the budget today with the understanding that there may be changes going forward and that those changes will, will be brought in front of the executive committee to approve. And um, that, um, you know, we will of course make make uh, the state committee aware, but um, this is um, th this is the budget that we're approving now and it's, it's a solid one, so based on what we know today. Any um, questions, discussion, changes? Going once, going twice. Um, and, yes. and, sorry, Matt Levin. Yes. Question, I'm sorry, I may have missed this. Um, the This has been reviewed by which? By the this been, this has been, uh, Matt, this has been reviewed by budget budget and finance. Um, the and this actual this actual inter iteration came together as a result of input from budget and finance, and then the executive committee uh, accepted it this week. And and would you care care to characterize those conversations, or just help us those of us who weren't part of um, those committees? They were help frankly us have a sense of how it went. Yeah, they were frankly pretty pleased. We were able to give the behind the scenes rationale for, you know, the the, the personnel costs and so forth. Um, and so we just really want, our goal was to, to give you a balanced budget. Um, and we feel this is realistic. We um, uh, are gradually collecting a lot more data on past expenditures to, to uh, justify this one. But I, since I have been so intimately involved with expenditures, you know, at administrative office expenditures uh, of the, from the state party budget, I feel confident that these are accurate. And uh, working with Claire, we feel that the personnel the, is accurate as well. Great, that, that's really helpful. And I'm sorry if I missed it. I, I think it's really helpful for those of us who aren't in all the committees and subcommittees when, when folks are reporting on this, or for instance, Claire, I didn't ask when you presented your work plan, it's really helpful to know 
what committees and subcommittees have reviewed things because I have great confidence that anything that's gone through the finance committee and the executive committee, I mean, I should be looking at it carefully anyway, but if it's gone through those, that, that review, then that gives me great comfort that a lot of folks have looked at it. So it's, it's, right. it's to your advantage as the people who are presenting it, it's to their advantage to say, oh yes, we've gone through these steps. And then the rest of us have a sense yeah. of comfort and, and confidence. Absolutely. So and Matt, thank you for that. Yeah, Matt, just so you know, with the budget, um, it, it's the, the, the making of this particular sausage was unattractive because when we first came together, budget and finance, it, it, it wasn't, it, it wasn't balanced at all. It was quite skewed. And it really is just due to excellent input from people that understand nonprofit budgeting and, uh, and then excellent uh, response from Claire um, and close working with Claire and Anne both on this to make, to bring this the one we have today to you. And thanks, that's good advice going forward, Matt. I appreciate it. So um, we are going to go to a voice vote. Actually, and yes. Samantha, she is posting in chat. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't Hi. see. Sorry, yes, Anna. yes, Samantha, please. Sorry. Like more elegant, but I can figure out how to raise my hand and not interrupt Matt. Um, I do have a question. So yes. when I look under the expenses at the very bottom um, on staff salaries, or basically all of our staff expenses. Um, it took me a minute to digest that this budget starts, the leftmost column is the is April. So I, it kind of makes sense to me go, going forward, going forward, but then it looks like there's another, there's a salary jump in December. Can you explain that? Is that like anticipated raises? Is that because we're losing, is that because we're hiring a new staff position in December? Um, what, what, what explains that projected increase in staff expenses after the election? Um, I can, I can take yeah. that one. Uh, our, our communications director position will, will be paid for uh, out of the coordinated budget during the coordinated election cycle. And at that point, we want that staffer to remain on on board because we'll still have work to do in in January, in March and February, or February and March. Um, so then we, we're just gonna move that back into being an admin expense. It's fairly typical, the data director and the coordinated director or the, the communications director are paid for out of the coordinated campaign because they work exclusively with that. Got it, that makes sense. Thanks, Claire. Because we don't wanna lose any ground, um, um, with our, as we're building, you know, as, as we're, as we're party building, we're party building toward the midterms, as Anne was saying, they're critically important, but we're also party building in 2023, uh, with, with our reorganization in the fall, um, and keeping that momentum going by bringing those people back into the admin budget is, is a critical part of that. Great. Thanks. All right. Any other questions? And if I don't see you just speak up. Those were helpful. All right. Um, we are going to have a voice vote uh, to approve our annual budget, which um, starts uh, April 1st. Um, all in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed? All right, our budget is passed. And again, thank you very much, Deb. This was a lot of work and to both the executive committee and the budget and finance committee. And um, Noah Detzer, who's also been very active in this. So it's it's really good to have an active uh, uh, assistant treasurer as well, who's been, who's been on it. Um, now, we are going to move to the DNC report from Mary and Tim who are live on the scene in Washington. Take it away, Tim and Mary. Um, thank you very much. Um, Tim and I were both so um, happy to just be back uh, in person. And uh, it just makes for such a more robust, you know, interactive, whatever, wonderful meeting. Um, and I wanted to say that I really think that um, we have the absolute right chair at the right time. Um, Jamie Harrison is, um, so energetic, so smart, so strategic, um, and probably one of the most approachable personal um, 
chairs that I've ever um, I've ever um, encountered. Uh, it was really wonderful to get him to know him better. Um, and I also wanted to point out uh, before I turn it over to Tim for more of a point by point um, that I I really appreciated Anne and Claire for the fantastic networking um, that they were doing. I mean, they didn't miss a beat and really keeping an eye open for our fundraising opportunities and Indeed. whatever. Um, so I um, just really wanted to thank them for that. And Claire has already gone over the um, the. Um, um, the money that we received from the DNC uh, for our coordinated campaign. Um, and I think that speaks highly for our, uh, for our party. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to um, Tim for more point by point. Thanks, Mary. And uh, personally, to add to what Ann said at the beginning of the meeting, to have the president show up um, given all he's been through and give just a, an amazing speech. He had everybody on their feet all the time. And then for the vice president to come at the end of the meeting, um, she was just back from Poland where she got very good reviews on what she did. Um, she was obviously tired and, but just gave a great speech, very personal about stories of uh, people from Ukraine that she had been talking to. So it, it was a pretty rousing um, meeting and I wish everybody could have been there in person. Anyway, uh, for what actually happened and what's important to Vermont, um, the resolutions committee was unable to, has been unable to get some resolutions done on a timely basis. For instance, if there wanted to be a resolution against um, Russia right now, it goes through all kinds of gyrations and committees. So they, they did pass, a, um, they passed a resolution to change that to make it easier for the executive committee, committee to get involved and get resolutions passed quickly when that's needed. Um, more importantly, the, the Rules and Bylaws Committee, which is always of interest, as people are starting to look at the midterms in 2024, is what, what is the nominating process for president gonna look like? And there is a committee, this is gonna be on a fast track now because we are gonna vote at the summer meeting on what kind of changes there might be to things like the Iowa caucus, the New Hampshire primary, the whole start of the process so that everybody can compete equally and that people feel like the states that are represented are racially and um, diverse and just represent all of America. So there's a couple of options. One is just that they demote Iowa because their caucus doesn't really work very well um, and no other changes. It is possible mm -hmm. that it'll get gridlocked and there'll be no changes because each state's input is very, very important. And um, so they could make some changes with New Hampshire as well. Or I think what most of us would favor is that they would go with tranches of primaries where the, the very first primary might include four or more states that are very representative of um, the country. And then that the future primaries are not a whole bunch of states like Super Tuesday but whether you can get all this done at once, I don't know. But it's very interesting. This is going to happen soon. If you have any input, give it to us because they are taking input now. The last thing I think I would mention is that the there's always talk at the DNC about the 50 state strategy. The finances of the DNC are in very good shape. The treasurer reported that they have like four times the amount of cash on hand that they had at this point in the last cycle. So President, uh, Director Harrison has been really created stuff for the 50 state strategy. There, there's money for red states. You've seen that small states like us have just gotten extra money plus the amount that we get month by month. So there is a, a real commitment to the 50 state strategy. And um, I think that'll, that'll continue, but there will be tension and particularly with the midterms, there will be tension increasing about the 50 state strategy meets the immediacy of the need to maintain the US Senate and the US House in democratic hands. And there's always controversy about where that money goes, but hopefully there'll be enough that everybody is reasonably happy with the outcomes on that and that we have enough to compete everywhere and make sure that we maintain majorities in Senate and House. So other than that, Thank we, you, it was Mary. a great meeting. Glad to be back in person. Yeah, that's great. Um, because it's not quite 11, I'm, I'm gonna use this. And I, and I just wanna say that um, 
Yeah, David and Claire were both amazing in um, getting around and meeting people and bringing folks together and introducing, uh, and actually Mary and Tim, you know, introducing all of us to the, the folks they know. Um, Mary and Tim are well-known and well-respected down there. And I just want to share a quick little anecdote, Mary, uh, our little dinner that we got to have with um, Chair Harrison, unless maybe you want, do you want to tell what happened there? Go ahead. <laughs> okay, so um, we were all invited, which was amazing, to a beautiful um, reception at the Taiwanese embassy. And um, they served just this amazing buffet and we all piled our uh, plates full. And then we saw, oh, there's no place to sit because they were hoping it would be outside, but it was too cold. So Mary and I looked around and um, there was a room with a sofa and sitting in that sofa was Chair Harrison. And we just, uh, you know, plumped ourselves down next to him. And as Mary said, um, he was just so uh, personable and welcoming and smart and kind. And uh, we had a really great discussion. And if, uh, uh, we um, got to hear about his Senate run, which was pretty incredible. And we, of course, uh, touted little Vermont uh, and said how exciting, how excited we are about uh, the big races that we have coming up. But it was just an incredible experience to um, be welcomed by him in that way. And uh, it, it, it will stick with us for a long time, I think. Um, and it was just, we, we are a great team. I think we all were congratulating ourselves on, on being, being at the DNC together. Um, is there any new business, which I, I think there's not because no one gave me any. Uh, Connor, did you want to say something? Yeah, how are you, Anne, and everybody? Good to, you. Uh, good, good to see everybody this morning. Um, just wanted to give a plug. Uh, I'm chairing the new Field and Grassroots Committee with uh, Jenny Gardner from Rutland County. And we're just starting to get kicked off. Uh, we had an initial meeting just of the chairs with uh, Claire yesterday and, and developed a survey we'd like to send around to town and county chairs just to get a snapshot of where you are right now. How often are you meeting? What types of things are you doing? Uh, just keeping in mind that you may have about six more meetings left until the November election. And what, what we want to do on this committee is be a resource to you. Make sure you're in the mindset that, okay, if you have 12 hours left, to spend between now and November. What, what are you doing with your eyes to the electorate? So we're not talking to each other and we're really having a field focus, you know? We wanna make sure everybody has somebody with their county who knows how to use van. Uh, we wanna make sure phone banks and canvassing is happening. We wanna work with the communications committee to make sure you have a, a list of all the press in your area um, and, and doing things like maybe sitting down for an hour and everybody writing letters to the editor and coming out with a stack of it um, rather than doing traditional things like having a guest speaker, you know, in these meetings coming up. So really just shifting the focus, making sure everybody's on the same page, but not taking a cookie cutter approach either. Uh, but we want to be a resource to you. And the first part is just seeing where you are now. Um, so I think Claire is going to send that out to you next week. We'll get the snapshot. We'll get the full committee meeting uh, together in the next couple of weeks. And uh, we'll be in touch with you soon. But really looking forward to uh, serving on this committee and working with all of you. So thanks a million. Connor, thank you. And this is precisely why there is a field and grassroots committee. You couldn't have said it better, what the purpose of it is, that you are here for everybody. And uh, wow, you really shine a light on the fact that there's, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, we are in campaign mode and we need to be acting that way. Um, and I know that Connor and Jenny would be happy to talk to any uh, county chairs or other town chairs or folks who really want to understand from folks who've done it really well for many years, how do you um, get out to your voters? How do you message them at the at, at your local level, which is what this committee is about. So thanks a lot. Um, any other announcements or new business? I have an announcement, but let's see. And do you have a minute? Yes. Hi, uh, Ed Cafferty. I just want to bring to everybody's attention that the state legislature is finalizing the legislative district maps. And that's going to be both for the Senate and for the House of Representatives. And it's based on the new US Census data. The map for the state Senate, uh, which is being proposed, appeared today in the Vermont Digger. So you can 
you easily pull up that map to see how it affects your area because there are going to be changes. There are both on the House side and on the Senate side, and that's going to affect you know, the elections that you're going to go, you find yourself in over the next few months. So I just wish you to pay attention to those maps and, um, and that's what I want to say. Thank you. And I think a good start for all of us is that VT Digger article. It's very helpful. Other announcements before I share one. Anybody want to share something exciting going on in your county that others might want to duplicate? Yeah. Yes. Um, <clears throat> Monday. Can you introduce yourself, please? Yes. My name is Asher from uh, Bennington. I'm chair of the Bennington Town Democratic Party. Yes, Asher. This Monday, we're going to have Peter Welch as our guest speaker, which is very exciting. Uh, I believe I've posted on the Vermont Democrat Facebook group. Also, if you know anybody who would be interested in joining a disability caucus, uh, please reach out to myself, uh, Anne, or David, or Claire, uh, because I would love to uh, see a disability caucus prosper and thrive in our state. In order to do that, we're going to need folks with disabilities who affiliate or associate themselves with the Democratic Party to really get involved and uh start uh, campaigning and uh, lobbying some folks. So please uh, keep that in mind going forward. Thank you. Thank you for that plug. That's important. Anyone else? Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> if, if you think of something after my announcement, then go ahead. Um, I want to uh, make sure that everybody has heard about the exciting in-person event that's coming up very soon in uh, less than two weeks, hard to believe. Uh, the second annual Pro Tem and Senate Caucus celebration is happening live and in-person. That's um, yeah Thursday, March 31st at the Capitol Plaza. I've bought my ticket. Um, time for you to buy yours too. And uh, we really hope that many of you will join there. It's going to be an incredible chance to um, celebrate our, our senators and their Senate victories um, and the, the terrific um, work they've done over this um, session. And also just to, to meet and greet folks in person for the first time in a long, long time. And I, I hope that many of you will support this um, important event, which of course it's fun and great for all of us, but it's also a really important fundraiser. It helps pay for our um, for our fabulous um, Senate aide Sally Short and for the uh, upcoming campaigns, which um, we certainly need to be supporting. So um, ticket info is on the VDP website, and many of you have received the invitation. Um, if if you're on our uh, if you're on our list, that's that's come through to you. So I hope you'll be signing up, and uh, I look forward to seeing you there. Um, other uh, other announcements, and and yeah, just uh, as for uh, May seventh, you'll be getting a save the date um, any minute now today, I think, from Claire. So that's great. All right, anything else from anyone? Well, congratulations to us. We're adjourning before eleven. Um, don't hold me to it. This might not happen every time, but um, that's that's pretty great. And I do want to say that um, next time we really are planning on meeting in person. That's our, our hope and expectation. So we can't wait to see everyone um, in May. All right. Um, we will officially now uh, stand adjourned. Thank you all. You're very patient. Thanks, everybody.